the Hotchkiss Library. Dan will do a demo of a sourdough bread recipe, and that will take about 20 minutes, I believe. And uh, as I said, you can ask some questions or chat them over, and then afterwards we'll um, turn it over for a discussion and Q&A, and you can ask your questions. Um, I'd just like to say that, you know, we were really sorry we couldn't hold our regular book signing this year. It was very sad for us to make that decision. And uh, we did some brainstorming and wanted to still find a way where we could connect authors and books um, with our patrons and in the community. And we couldn't be happier to be kicking this series off with this great cookbook. Um, for so many of us, we've turned to baking during this uncertain time for sustenance, sustenance and comfort. Um, and it will be a great thing to learn about this evening. Um, the only thing missing is a loaf of fresh bread. Um, we, we have that. We, you have we that. Have we have that. <laughs> you have that. So that's great. So let me introduce Dan. He's one of the country's pioneer artisanal bakers. He studied philosophy at the University of Wisconsin and graduated from the Culinary Institute of America. And he then worked in some of New York's top kitchens. He turned to his quest to learn the art of bread baking after a trip to France. And in 1983, he opened Bread Alone in Woodstock, New York. Bread Alone now operates four cafes, including at their Kingston, New York headquarters. They bake and distribute countless loaves of bread each day, which are sold at stores and farmers markets all over the region. Dan has written three cookbooks. The first one in 1993, Bread Alone, which I'm really happy to say, this is our copy from our collection at the library and we still have it in our collection. Um, and uh, his second book was Local Breads in 2011, and both of those were winners of International Association of Culinary Professionals Awards. And last fall, he published this beautiful book, Living Bread, which you probably all know by now, on Wednesday won the James Beard Award for the best baking book of the year. So congratulations, Dan. We're so happy to have you here, especially this week. Uh, as I said, Dan will demonstrate the process for sourdough this evening, and then we will um, talk uh, further with Q&A. So it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you and to welcome Dan Leader. Hey, everyone. I'm sorry I can't see you in person, and uh, I can't say I'm a, 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 a veteran at doing these Zoom meetings, so we'll see how it goes. Um, the first thing I want to say is that there's a huge amount of hype around sourdough right now. I mean, if you go on Instagram, there are literally tens of thousands of photographs and how to's and millions of questions and special techniques. And, you know, it's, and, and, and you, you, you follow these and it sounds really complicated. Okay. So the first thing I want to tell you is that making sourdough bread really simple okay there's two ingredients flour and water and two invisible ingredients time and temperature and um, uh, there's actually two schools of sourdough um, bread making uh, I'm gonna demonstrate one tonight uh, the second one is very similar and um, those two schools are either a liquid sourdough that looks like a pancake batter or a firm sourdough that would be like a medium body uh, bread dough, okay? And um, it seems that the liquid sourdough is, is becoming much more popular, and in some ways it's easier for the home baker. So I'm just gonna uh, stick with that. Uh, and maybe one other, one other time we could, do a, we could do a class on firm sourdoughs. So the first thing I wanna do is show you what a mature starter looks like, okay? You can see, all the bubbles in it there you can see it's it's kind of like percolating you know you can see it's it's full of bubbles and nooks and crannies and this and if you could smell this 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 just erupted with a smell like an earthy uh slightly flowery uh it's slightly bubbly sour earth tones mushroomy um and this particular sourdough um, I'm using a flour here. I'm, I'm up in northern Maine right now, and we're using a flour. It's almost a whole wheat flour from um, one of the uh, new mills that are popping up around the country, and this is called Maine Grains, and they're using, um, 
They're grinding their flour from wheat grown uh, in Maine. And you'll see that the flour is fairly dark. This is not a sifted, a sifted white flour. This is maybe has 15% of the bran sifted out. If we had a, if we had a white dough, it would, the starter would look a little bit more like this. This one's a little bit past its prime, but, but um, it's, this is from a, a mixture of white flour and whole wheat flour, okay? So to make a sourdough, it's actually very simple. And um, um, I'm not gonna talk through every detail now because it's, it's all very carefully laid out in the book, but I'm taking, I'm actually gonna step back for a second. Um, for those of you who aren't comfortable with metric, um, all of the recipes in the book are metric, meaning that everything's in grams. Um, and I, I, I say to people who are intimidated by the metric system, you don't have to understand how the system works. You only have to know how to read a step. Okay? So we're not going to get into the, the hows and whys of metric. We're just going to say that, that when I have a recipe, it calls for, uh, like, for example, this sourdough, this is 100 grams of water. And this is 100 grams of flour, okay? So the first step in making a liquid sourdough is I'm simply gonna take the 100 grams of flour and the 100 grams of water, and I'm gonna mix it together, okay? And it's gonna make kind of like a, a slightly, at first it's gonna be like a slightly thick pancake batter, okay? And the reason that this isn't um, a thinner is that this is a flour that has quite a bit of bran and, and German it so that it, it tends to absorb more water, but that's, that, that's, that's fine. So I just did the, the initial 10 seconds of work to start my sourdough starter, okay? And what I've done, what I'm gonna do now is I would cover this and I would let this sit for 24 hours uh, at room temperature, okay? And at the end of 24 hours, it's not gonna look like a lot, it's changed. It's gonna look like maybe you'll see a few bubbles in it. If you look here now, just in the time that, that I've mixed this, you can see that it's starting to bubble again. So you might see after a day, a couple bubbles, okay? So then what you do day two, so it's sat here for 24 hours. Day two, I'm gonna take half of this, okay? So right now it's 200 grams of, of, of flour and water combined. I'll take 100 grams out and I'll add 50 grams of water and 50 grams of flour. So after day two, after I feed it a second time, it's essentially gonna look exactly like that again, okay? I will have discarded, uh, I, and I'll talk about a lot of buzz on the internet about uh, of sourdough di discards, and I'll talk about that in a second. Again, it's very simple. So this process of, of discarding 100 grams of the, of the batter and adding 50 grams of water and 50 grams of flour will go on from anywhere between seven and 14 days, okay? It really, I, I've had sourdoughs erupt after seven days, five days. I've had them take as long as 10 or 12. There's no, um, there's no reason why it goes faster or slower. I've sat with, uh, with biologists who've studied sourdoughs and said, why is it that sometimes it takes eight days and some days sometimes it takes six days and sometimes it takes 12 days before it starts to look like this, okay? It's just a matter of time and temperature and the season of the year and, and the, the warmth of your house and the humidity of your house. And basically what's happening in your sourdough culture is that wild yeast and lactobacilli are feeding off of the, the, the starches and the sugars that are available in the flour. And the byproduct of that is um, CO2 and lactic acid. So when we look here and we see the bubbles, Basically, what we're seeing is that the wild yeast and lactobacilli are feeding off of the available starches and sugars. And the reason that you have to continually feed sourdoughs, and we're going to talk about when you actually have an active starter and how you, how you, how you maintain it, 
it's a living organism. Once you get this going, it's a living organism and it basically needs a couple of things. It needs food, it needs water, and it needs a comfortable place to live, okay? And that's it. I mean, th what I have just done for you is the basic of sourdough. And Mick, my son-in-law, who's holding the camera, has done this many times. And Mick, I'm just gonna have you chime in. How long is it? And they, he's been growing sourdoughs in Chicago. How long does it generally take you? Uh, mine usually take uh, longer. Uh, I'm usually looking at 12 to 14 days before I feel like they're ready to bake with. Um, and, and about six days into it, I think I've ruined it. Uh, but sticking with it and continuing to feed it and cut out half uh, usually, well, actually up to this point has always uh, resulted in viable sourdough. Yeah, yeah. So you just have to be patient. And, you know, using, I would say the things that help it are using or organic flour and um, having a stable temperature. Um, uh, you know, if you have a place uh, like a cabinet, it's like a nice cool place. You don't want it too warm and you don't want it too cool. Um, and you just want to give it time. And as Mick said, sometimes you think it's not doing anything, but it is, it is almost, it's almost, Almost never have I had people not had success if they stick with this process. So just to repeat it again, it's 100 grams of flour, 100 grams of water, it's 24 hours, uh, you discard half, and then you add 50 grams of water and 50 grams of flour, and you just keep repeating that over and over. And the, the, the rule of thumb when your sourdough is ready, if it doubles in volume in six to eight hours, it's strong enough to leaven bread, okay? If you, if you um, a whole wheat flour like this might take a little bit longer to double, but certainly if you're using, you know, uh, um, a flour like a King Arthur bread flour or a lighter flour, it will double in six to eight hours. And sometimes it's very helpful if you, ha if you have an active sourdough, like what we just did here, stirring it, it actually helps the sourdough uh, uh, you know, you're giving it fresh air, um, oxygenating it a little bit, just really helps. And you'll see by the time uh, we come back to this in a minute, you'll see, and actually you're gonna see, you can, you can see that some of the bubbles starting right now, they're gonna, they're gonna, I can see the beginnings of them. That's how active it is. It just starts bubbling and bubbling. And we fed the sourdough, when was the last time we fed it, Mix? Uh, about 24 hours yeah, ago. Yeah, so this, is, this has been sitting in our, in our basement for 24 hours. Okay, so before um, I get to actually making the bread, I want to talk about, so here we are, we have this nice sourdough, okay, and how do we keep it so we always have a nice starter to use when we want to make our bread? One is I always like to have a favorite sourdough container, and generally what you would do is you would feed the, sour, the starter, leave it out for about an hour or two, and if you look here, you can see it's bubbling already, just in that little in that little minute. Um, uh, I generally leave it out for an hour or two, and then you can put it in the refrigerator. And, and just as, a, as an insurance policy, feed it once a week. Like if you're not gonna bake for a couple of weeks, do exactly that same thing. Throw 50% of it uh, aside, and then put um, uh, 50 grams of, of flour and 50 grams of water. Now, what do you do with the discard, the, what you're, what you're, you're doing? Um, well, you know, we're very lucky here that we have a, hung, a hungry, a hung, a hungry three-year-old and we take the discard and we make waffles with it. Or you could, make, you could make pancakes with it. Or you could put a little bit if you were making some bread and you, just, you, 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 you could just knead it into the dough. The, the breads can be fairly forgiving. So there are a whole bunch of things that you can do with it. I have uh, several recipes in the book. I've got a, 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 a babka made from sourdough discard in the book. I've got kind of a, a French baguette with discard. So th there, there's plenty of ways of, of, of using it. So you don't have to worry about th uh, throwing that flour away, especially now when flour is hard to come by. Okay, so how do we make sourdough bread? Okay, now this recipe that I'm making today is the simplest uh, sourdough bread that I know that you can make. Um, there's no commercial yeast in it whatsoever, and it's very, very, very simple. So again, in metric, uh, I'm going to talk, it's 500 grams of flour, 
we're using this, uh, this uh, type 85 flour, and I'll talk a little bit about flours at the end, for main grains. Um, and so it's 500 grams of flour, it's 350 grams of water, and 150 grams of sourdough, okay? So I have, I have here 200 grams, okay? in this container. And so I would take 150 of this. I have 50 aside for, for the, the, to, that I can feed later, okay? And as a rule, I generally don't ever like to take all the sourdough out of my, my little sourdough crock. This way, you've always got active culture um, to, to feed from. Okay, so we're gonna kind of fast forward here into, into real life. And, uh, and what I've done here, is uh, I started this before, just to shorten the kneading process. Um, I put 500 grams of flour, 350 grams of water. I put 150 grams of sourdough starter, the starter right there, and 10 grams of salt. That is it, okay? That is it. And there's a technique that um, um, is, is very good for sourdough bread making to make for a very, elastic, um, chewy crumb, um, is a, it's called an auto lease. And an auto lease is you take your flour and your water and your sourdough and you just blend it together and you let it sit for about an hour, okay? So you're, you're literally mixing it for two minutes. You're not really developing any gluten. You're just allowing the, the, uh, the flour to absorb the liquid. Okay, and it looks something like this. Okay, so it just looks like a, a, a wet dough. So this hasn't really been kneaded. It's just been mixed together and the flour has absorbed all the liquid. Okay, and what this does is by having this very kind of um, uh, relaxed, massive, undeveloped dough, when I actually go to knead the dough, it's gonna to come together a lot together because I'm not pulling ingredients together. I'm immediately um, starting to develop the gluten. So you can see, even in a few seconds, this dough is starting to come together. Okay, there. In 10 seconds, uh, this is coming together. Okay? And um, I'm gonna just, can everyone hear me okay with this mixer going? Yes. Okay, okay, great. So I'm just gonna need this at very, very slow speed for about, for about five minutes, okay? Okay. And you can see the muscle developing, you can see the gluten developing. Um, if I take a piece of this dough, you'll see it's already got some strength and some elasticity, okay? And we would continue uh, kneading it like this for about five or six minutes, okay? And the longer we knead it, the more elastic the dough is gonna become, okay? And the smoother it's gonna come. You can see right now, they call this a little bit shaggy. You can see these kind of rough edges around it. And as the dough, as the, as the gluten develops, it's gonna become smoother and, small and more elastic. Okay, so I'm just gonna fast forward just a little bit here. Okay, normally I wouldn't do what I'm doing now for about, about five minutes, but I'm, I just, for the sake of speeding the process along, you know, one of the qualities of great sourdough bread is you wanna, you wanna incorporate as much water as possible in the dough. And the way you do it is you develop the strength of the dough. You can see this is starting to develop uh, some strength. If I, if I speed it up for a second, you're gonna see that it's developing a little bit more. And there's a French technique that I love. Um, I love, I love the, the name of the French. They call it to bassinage the dough, to bathe the dough. And what you're doing is you're, you're kneading the dough and you like like a teaspoon at a time you you add you add water to it 
and the water is able to kind of get absorbed very easily because you're adding you're adding the, the water in a slow quantity. So, and you would do that until the dough, you've added another 25, 30 grams of water, depending on, um, depending on the strength of the flour, depending on um, the, a lot's gonna just depend on the, on the strength of the flour. And it's interesting, we, we've been baking for about a week now, I think actually a couple of weeks with this um, with this um, flour from Maine grains, okay. And I'm normally I would have needed it longer, but I didn't want to. I don't want to keep the mixer on for so long. So then what happens is after you finish kneading the dough, we do this this technique where we fold the dough, okay, like so. Okay, and I'm just gonna show you the difference and what happens in just a matter of a couple minutes. So, um, if I let this relax for even a minute or two, and I do this again, you'll see how much strength is developed in just a short period of time, okay? And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of buzz on the internet now about people not kneading their dough and just folding it like this, um, which is fine. I, I personally find it a little, a little, a little, um, a little tiring to be folding the dough every hour for three or four hours. Uh, but if we did do that, that the dough is going to get more and more elastic. So generally, what I do with the simple sourdough bread is we will knead the dough anywhere between eight and 12 minutes. I'll give it a fold and then I'll put it in this container for two hours, okay? At the end of two hours, I'll fold it again, okay? I'll let it go for another hour or two, I'll fold it again. And then what we've been doing here is we have a very cool basement here. Uh, we will let this rise in the basement uh, uh, overnight, okay, and um, and then we'll shape it in the morning. So, but this is it. I mean, this is how simple the process the process is, and and so you're letting the, the bread rise very very slowly, and what's happening in that in that process, the lactobacilli and the wild yeast is feeding off of the starches and sugars in the in the dough, and this bread does not rise. The way um, the way you'd expect a yeast bread to like when when we when after a few hours it basically just fills this container. Okay, it's a very gentle rise. And I'm going to do this once more just for the sake of, and you can see just in this time here. I hope you can see it, but the dough is much, much more developed than it was even two minutes ago. It really develops a lot of elasticity really quickly. Okay, so all we're gonna do now is let this rise, and then I will shape it into a bowl, okay? And then, for those of you who don't have any fancy uh, baking gadgets at home. I just create this little, this little like bed for the for the sourdough for the sourdough bread, and this is just a French kitchen towel and a glass bowl. So after it's risen, I um, I I just round it up very gently. I dust this with flour, okay, the the the, the uh, cloth with flour, and I just let this let this. Uh, uh, rise either in the refrigerator or if I'm in a cool room in the cool room for anywhere two to four hours. So really there's a lot of time but very little work. I always say that the making sourdough bread is a little work and a lot of weight. Okay so then I want to show you how we we bake the bread. There's this very cool gadget that a lot of people are using Dutch ovens but there's this guy in Chicago 
who developed something called the Challenger bread pan. And it's actually, this is very hot, uh, it's actually really interesting because what it is is a, a cast iron pan with a very low lift. And it, it, um, it's designed to have the bread expand in the, in the pan and to be able to get the bread in and out very easily. So all I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take this like so. I'm gonna turn the bread over like so. I'm just gonna give this a simple score, something very, very simple like that, okay? People do all kinds of fun things now. If you go on the internet, you see people who are spending hours scoring their bread, okay? And I am going to just cover this like, like so. I am going to put this back in the oven. And we're going to leave it covered like that for um, 20 minutes. And this is at, um, my, my oven here runs a little cool, a little hot. So we're at 410 degrees. And we're going to leave it there covered for, for 20 minutes. And then we're going to uncover it. And we're going to leave it for another 30 minutes uncovered. Okay. And what's happening inside of it right now, all the steam and all the moisture from the loaf is getting trapped in that cast iron dome, uh, which is gelatinizing the starches, okay, and allowing the bread to really expand. Okay, so it's like the bread's being baked in this intense, it's like a brick oven, it's like a, it's like a mini brick oven. So this is, this gadget is actually called the Challenger bread pan. And I actually think it's a, it's a, a great little thing. And I believe, does he sell these too, Mick? No, I don't know where that is. This is just a, a, a double edged razor with a holder, but there's lots of companies that are selling these now. And then we made this earlier today. Okay. Oh, we're gonna go with it. Okay. We made this earlier today, and that's the, the exact the exact same bread. Okay. And um, this is a this is essentially a whole wheat bread. If we had made this from a lighter flour, it would have been it would have been uh, a taller. But I really like making. Um, breads from whole grain flours, and we haven't cut this yet. No, let's, let's cut it. Let's yeah, cut let's it. Cut it. Yeah, yeah, right right here. Yeah, that smells great. It smells really great. And you can see it's a nice dense dark loaf. Like this, this is reminiscent of like a country bread in France. You know, it's not, it's not uh, at all a, a, a white bread, but if you could smell this right now, the whole kitchen has just exploded with, with the aroma of uh, rich sourdough bread. And that's it. I mean, it, it is no more complicated uh, than, than I did. And if you don't have the fancy cast iron pans, you could use any Dutch oven. That the, the that pan just makes it makes it um, a, a little bit easier. So if we want, we could we could deal with some questions now. I think we're right on schedule. Great, that's great. Thank you. Gosh, I wish we could pass that around and I'll have a slice now with uh, some good butter on it. Well, it looks delicious. Do you have a favorite bread uh, in the book, uh, Dan? Or is that like That's asking really if you have a favorite yeah. child? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing about the book is that the recipes come from a variety of places. There's some great German breads, there are French breads, there's sourdough breads, there's some yeah, bread from Italy that's really delicious. Uh, uh, I have this 100% rye bread from Auvergne that's really delicious. There's a whole group of, it's 60 recipes. So there's a lot of recipes and they don't repeat themselves. That's great. Anybody have any uh, questions they'd like to ask? Yeah, can I uh, um, ask a question? What you talked about the difference between like doing the the folding every thirty minutes for two and a half hours or three hours, or just doing that sort of once or twice? Does that does that have an effect on the rise, or does that affect um, on the ultimate taste? What's the what's the well, difference so, between? So, so what's happened now in this home world of bread making 
there's this there's this movement against needing doughs in a machine. I don't know why, but people are folding their doughs. Like there's there's all these Instagram sites, no need breads. Um, I I I'm a professional baker. I'm used to using machines. This is the style every every professional baker I ever worked with has used kneading machines. So I like the, the mix of both. Um, I like kneading the dough and then doing a couple folds. But there are there are, there are people out there who who they do the entire thing by folding and they make really nice bread. I think it's just a matter of style. I don't think it's a matter of what's better or not. Okay, thanks. Can you talk a little bit about why you prefer to use organic flour? Yeah, well, you know, from, from the day bread alone opened, we've been certified organic. Uh, you know, from someone who's toured a lot of wheat fields uh, in the Midwest, when you walk on the soil of an organic farm versus the soil of a, of a conventional farm, the soil's different. Um, you know, the, the pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, preservatives that they use in the wheat industry are really powerful and some people would say toxic. And, um, and you know, wheat is not like an apple. You know, like you don't wash that stuff off. And so um, I feel very strongly about using um, organic wheat um, and, and the bread I make. Uh, you Kelly has a question. Yes, hello. Uh, you mentioned that when you were letting the bread dry, so you would put it in a cool place. I thought yep. the bread had to rise in a, in a warm um, place. Yeah, when, when you're making sourdough bread, you want to re, re you want to think about it as a, as a different, um, as a different organism because the, a cool rise, let's say something between, think of bread like cheese or beer or wine as a fermented food, okay? So while it ferments at a cooler temperature, you're developing flavor, you're developing texture, uh, you're developing a unique bubbly crumb, which you're not gonna get if you proof it in a warm, in a warm place. So you have to think of our sourdough bread as a different kind of food. And why is it called sourdough anyway? Well, because the, 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 the wild yeast and the lactobacilli, um, uh, um, have, um, they, let, they, they release lactic and acetic acids as, as they grow, as, as they feed off of the starches and sugar in the flour. And those acids, uh, you know, um, can develop uh, uh, an intensity and depending, like if you look at like the most famous sourdough bread in this country, which is in San Francisco, if you think about the climate there, it's cool and damp a lot. So that those, those lactobacilli uh, tend to produce more acids in that environment. And then the whole, the whole science of what type of sourdough you're growing is something that there's been a huge amount of research on. And the average home baker will never know what type of lactobacilli they're growing. There's uh, all different varieties. And I don't even think it's important to know. Um, I just think it's important to get skilled at what you do. Thank you. I have a question. Oh. Yes, go ahead. If, if I don't have a fancy machine like your bread mixer, do I use a wooden spoon or a spatula? Absolutely, a absolutely. Uh, there's, there's actually, um, um, uh, I'll give a plug for someone else who I have great respect for. There's a woman uh, on, 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 the, on Instagram who's got a site called Foolproof Baking. And she makes these big bubbly breads, these very white doughs with lots of nooks and crannies and bubbles in it. And she doesn't, she, she basically doesn't use any machines, but she's got this elaborate folding technique. I don't know how many times she folds, but it's, it's probably or eight times over a 12 hour period. Was that a special dough hook on your mixer? I haven't seen a dough hook that looked like that. 
Yeah, that's, I just, you know, my, my, my mixer, that's a KitchenAid mixer. That's just a standard KitchenAid mixer, a standard dough hook, nothing special. Okay. Any, any KitchenAid mixer has that. Great. I think uh, Janet has her hand raised. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, in the beginning, when you divided the starter in half, yeah. and you said then that you need to add the, you know, additional flour and water, do you put that into the... The amount remaining in the bowl, and then what do you do with the part you take out? Does okay. that become so, an additional starter? So, so, so basically, let's say we we let's say here we are. So here we are with 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water. Okay, so let's pretend it's 24 hours later. I'm going to split this in half. I'm going to take out 100 grams. I'm going to add 50 grams of water, 50 grams of flour, and that 100 grams that I'm going to took out take out. I'm going to put that in pancake batter or waffle batter or banana banana bread. It's not going to affect, um, it's such a small quantity, it's not going to affect the other thing that you're making, okay? And, and so I'm always, I'm always maintaining 200 grams, okay? So I take out 100, I'm adding back in 100. Does that make sense? Am I am I oversimplifying it? Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Yeah, Dan, I'll ask a question. Um, part of what I enjoyed about the book so much is just the. I mean, it's obviously an interesting cookbook, but also the travels that you've been able to take in, in researching and in, in the life of a baker. Oh. Is there something? I, again, it's like Gretchen's question about your favorite child. Is there a, is there a bread or a culture that, that, is there a culture that you found made the bread that was just absolutely the well, best? I, that I, will, I, 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 will, I will say this. There was a place that I found very special um, that I didn't expect. So I spent uh, a week in Sicily uh -huh. and I was visiting uh, an organic wheat farmer there who grows a type of wheat. There's actually a picture of me in the book the beginning of the book, um, he, they make a type of wheat called Senatori Capelli. It's this very, very tall wheat. It's about six feet tall. Like literally, I can get lost in the wheat field. You can't see your way out. It's that big two big spread at the beginning of the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and that woman introduced me to an agronomist at the Uni University of Palermo, who's basically been going around Sicily, uh, Southern Italy, Northern Africa, finding old varieties of wheat, uh, doing test plots, doing testing, and and then expanding the plots as they as they could. And then they had millers there who were able to segregate the wheat. Very small millers that were able to segregate the wheat and do uh, pure pure bags of flour, Parashino, Mallorca, uh, Senator Capelli. There's a whole variety, a whole school of, of flowers that they produce there. And when I brought bags of flour back, I made bread like I never tasted before. The exact, like the exact same process I just did here, the breads were so unbelievably delicious uh, from these unique types of wheat. And it was all stone ground flour that, you know, here we talk a lot about weeds and local milling but the reality is that that we're kind of starting over like if you talk to people at Cornell University about the wheat that we're growing in New York or Vermont or Connecticut they're literally guessing at what types of wheat will go grow well in the Northeast because we haven't grown wheat here for a long time and what was so interesting about being in Sicily is that they have they're finding these these traditional varieties of wheat um, that, that have been grown for centuries and they're isolating them and making flour from them. And uh, it, was just, it was just fascinating both from a historical point of view and from a baking point of view, how delicious um, um, uh, the breads were. And I'll, I'll, I'll end this with a quick story. Uh, I visited a farmer in, um, uh, uh, near Parma and um, I'll just sort of a little history here is that um, 
we read we read a lot about modern wheat. Modern wheat is bad. No, I, I don't want to get into this too much, but no, but no, uh, no, the who was responsible for changing wheat in the world was Mussolini, because at that point in history, uh, Italy was importing too much wheat and they couldn't grow enough. So they did all this work with agronomists and they disregarded a lot of the old the old varieties and they made a lot of newer varieties and it changed the way wheat was in Europe and it changed the way the wheat was being grown all over the world. Uh, but I met a farmer in Parma who found his grandfather's uh, grain stock from, uh, from before World War I and he started planting it again and he planted these, these types of wheat, a mixture of, of seeds and when he took it to universities in Italy, they had never seen varieties of wheat just like this. And they and he makes a type of flour called the, the Grano de Miracula, the, the, the miracle grains, because it survived, it survives this, this, this purge of modern wheat. And now you can actually go to Amazon and you can buy flour from this particular bit, uh, uh, farmer and this particular mill in Italy that's been bringing this, this, these particular old varieties back. So that, that, that I found really interesting. Yeah. Here's a picture. Here's the picture from the book. I don't know if you, everyone can see yeah. the huge fields. Yeah. yeah. Of wheat. And it's the, it's the um, you know, the caption needs to be, you know, Dan Leader, a man outstanding in his field. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, no, but I, I found the history very, very interesting in Italy because it was like this, this convergence of agriculture and politics and, and, and good food all converging in the same place. Can I just follow uh, up with the old grain thing, which is, is that what is, einkorn is also an old grain, right? Yeah, einkorn is actually, uh, einkorn, um, you know, in Italy, um, they use the term farro a lot. And farro is a type of either einkorn or spelt, depending on the area. So, um, Einkorn doesn't have a lot of gluten, so there is an einkorn bread in the book, but it's more like a porridge bread than a, a bread that you need. Okay, I know they grew a lot. That that there was a it used to be in Scandinavia quite a bit, I think, in the old days. Einkorn, but yeah. Um, Jean has her hand up. Do you have a question, Jean? Do you have a question, Jean? Oh, I'm ready. Yep. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Sorry. Um, I hear that Italy is a safe place for cel celiacs. And um, I was wondering if you do anything with um, gluten free bread. We do not do anything with gluten free bread. We make spelt bread. Um, but I'm, I, I'm, listen, I'm, not, I'm neither a nutritionist nor an agronomist. So I'm speaking now as a baker who bakes lots of bread for a long time, we have a lot of people who come to us with gluten sensitivity. They come to the bakery and they say, well, I, I, know I have problems with gluten sensitivity. And they're finding that people who aren't celiac, but people who have gluten sensitivity, uh, that they can eat sourdough bread because the sourdough acts like a probiotic, digesting a lot of the proteins and the gluten in the, in the, um, in the flour before we eat it. So um, we have a lot of customers who have no problem eating bread alone bread. One, because of the types of wheat that we're using, and two, because we make lots and lots of sourdough bread. All right, thank you. How many trips did you actually make to put the book together, Dan? Well, that's a complicated question because <laughs> I've been traveling, visiting bakeries in Europe for th over 30 years. And so some of the trips, information that I learned 20, 30 years ago, I went back and revisited. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure it's hundreds. Wow. I think that one of the Van Hoys has a question. Okay. I think John Van Hoy has a question. Okay, I didn't see. Great. Go ahead, please. John? Question probably, I'm guessing, right? I don't. Ready to go. Um, was his hand up? I don't see him here. Oh, there. Yes, his hand okay. was up. Great. Please go ahead, John. We can't hear you. Uh, let me see if I can un... He's... Uh, Looks like they're unmuted. Yep. 
Is you want to type your question in the chat and we can read it? He's probably going to unmute himself. He's showing a picture. He's showing a picture of something. Oh, he oh, is oh, unmuted. Hold on. Let me see if I can see the picture. Yeah. Oh, it's a. Oh, it's, it's that grid or something. They were in. They were in Sicily last fall. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, cool. That's great. Cool. Um, we. I make. How long has it been in the oven? We got four minutes before we can take. Lid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what? Well, I'm going to ask four more questions, and then we can take the lid off, or we can even take it off now if we want to wind up. Okay, Cindy. Uh, John, we can't. John, can you want to chat your right? Tab, type your question in the chat box, and we'll be able to read it out loud. I'll try muting and unmuting them and seeing if that makes sense. I, I just have to say this: this kitchen is smelling really good right now. <laughs> it's yeah. I have one. I have one question. Go We're for currently it. by. We're currently buying living bread from Paley's Market and Sharon. Is that very similar to the bread that you just made in your kitchen? I don't, you know, I'm not familiar with that, so I can't really say. Okay. You mean, it looks, it's a, it's a like it's, yeah. It's your, it's your bread, it's the living bread, right? No, bread alone, it's not, uh, my, comp, my, my bakery is called Bread Alone. Yes, it's by bread alone. Bread alone, okay. living bread. I don't. It's we don't make bread alone. It's a sourdough by bread alone. Okay. okay, I'm sure you have distributors all over. You can't keep track. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we, we, we're making. Uh, it's been very busy at the bakery. Uh, I'm actually quarantined. I, I'm I'm the reserve management of the bakery in case my son were to get sick. So. I'm quarantined. I just hear about how busy the bakery is. We can't bake enough bread every day. Literally, the, the staff runs nonstop every day. And since this whole crisis happened, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't make enough bread. How many loaves that. do you produce in one 24-hour period? I think, I think today, just sliced bread, it was somewhere around 20,000 breads today. Wow. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. What What is your opinion of the typical French baguette that you find in France? You know? <laughs> well, you know, you know, there's there's so many good breads now. I mean, there's a bit of a bread bread revolution revolution going on in this country. So there's a lot of really. I mean, I love French baguettes, and so um, I'm happy to see a lot of little bakeries popping up and making more more good bread because. You know, if you put all the good little bakeries together, it's maybe you know one quarter of one percent of the of of the bread market. So there, there, there's lots of room for good bakers in America. My my daughter here and I have been um, getting into making bread bread recently, and it's been a lot of fun. I can tell you, a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, we. We have been making, Mick has been making, Mick's become the family baker while, uh, <laughs> while we've been here. Um, and let's see how we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Oh, look at that. Oh, how gosh. nice is that? Wow. That All looks right. really beautiful, right? Great. Look at that. See how it exploded in the oven? Is anybody not hungry at this point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is, this bread's going to be even better than the other one. And the reason it's going to be better is that we had this in the refrigerator um, a good part of the day, so it rose re really, really, really slowly. But this is going to be, I can tell this is going to be a better tasting and a nicer texture than the other bread that we had, yeah, even though they were from essentially the same dose, right? Yeah, we made them the same time. You made them the same time. Yeah. Cynthia, you want to try one more time for your question? We can't hear you. Oh, no, actually, I, I just unmuted. So my question is, I'm experimenting with a lot of different flours. I've got some main grain, um, whole wheat. Yep. I've got some wild hive, um, yep. hard red double O. And I've got some King Arthur bread flour and King Arthur all-purpose. Yep. So do I need to use different quantities if I'm using, so norm, I'm normally using, I think. No, no, so, so here, here's what I, and this is a really important question. Um, if you want to become a good baker, get comfortable with one flour. Like we've been using this main grain type 85, and I would say it's taken Mick five times, six times to get really comfortable with yeah. it. Yeah. Um, 
And if you're switching flowers all the time, you're basically starting over. So what I would do is I would make, I would either do, I would, I would most likely use up one type of flower and then go to the next and take pictures of the bread so you can see which one you like the best and then stick with one flower that you really like. The main grain flowers, are, are you buying the whole wheat or they're sifted flowers? I've got the whole wheat. It's a very fine whole wheat. And I just made yeah, a yeah. loaf of, of that and a, one, and a loaf that was the um, wild hive. And they have very different textures. They're much oh, yeah, more- Oh, you're very the, um, wild, the, wild, the wild hive flower, it, his double O flower, I don't know why he calls it double O, but it's, a, it's basically a refined white flower. So, it, you know, it's going to be, it's not going to be as white as King Arthur flower, but I would assume that he's sifting quite a bit of bran and germ out of that flower. He said it was the closest to all purpose, but it's much more dense and tough and didn't have a lot of flexibility to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's very tricky because flowers are so different that if you haven't baked with it, um, it's, hard, it's hard for me as a baker to say, my guess if it's very tough, you're probably it's probably a uh, very absorbent so you probably need to get more water in it like this this bread that we have here this was about for 500 grams of flour we're almost like 390 grams of water so this is almost 80 percent water by baker's percent oh got it and i want to say if we look at the, i'm going to open it up for a second if you look at the oven spring on that this is almost a whole wheat flour so to get that kind of oven spring from a whole wheat flour is really good. Let's Thank try one much. more time for Cynthia and John. Can you try again with your question? They, they actually, they texted or they uh, sent me a message via chat because there's maybe a-, a Oh, great. Issue. So but what the, is their question? The question is, and um, they were in Sicily last fall, I think, and maybe still have some olives left from that trip. Um, the question for Dan was, when will they, do you have a sense of when we would have the same kind of choices here in the U.S. in terms of flour as they, ha as they had in Sicily? There was, there was apparently- uh, You know what? Um, it's gonna be a long time. I mean, it's, it's just, um, Sicily is just one of these very, very special places in the world. Um, so if you wanna get uh, Sicilian flour, um, I have sources in the back of the book, so you can get this, this mill I talk about, the Molini Riggi, you can actually get their flour here in this country, they have a distributor. So if you wanna be baking with those kind of flours, uh, you, you, know, you, can, you can get them. Um, there's also a, a mill called uh, Molino Grassi that I talk about in the book. You can get those flours from Amazon. Wow. Does that get the question for, for the Benoist? Uh, I have a question. Yes, Karen? Okay, a quick question. Uh, my starter smells sort of sweet, like like cooking apples or something. Flowery, but um, it's not. That, that, that's, that's not unusual. I mean, depending on the type of flower that you started with. Um, and, you know, again, most people don't know the mix of mi uh, microorganisms and wild yeast that are in a sourdough. So... Mm -hmm you know, you, you might have had some apples in your kitchen and maybe some of the wild yeast from the apples just kind of impregnated the, the culture. Um, but it's also, it's also if, you, if you use whole wheat flours, when you make your starter, they tend to be a little bit sweeter. And it's, I, uh, it tastes sour, but it does smell sweet. Yeah. Uh, this is Mick. I, um, I ferment cider at home in Chicago. And uh, until I brought my starter here, to Maine, it also smelled like apples, uh, because I'm sure I was sharing the same uh, the same organisms with my cider and my starter. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's it's kind of the fun of sourdough. Thank you. Great. Any last question from anybody? Well, this was super oh, great. Hey, sorry, I think there's one more hand. Is that you, Faye? Go for it. It Go is for it. me. Yes. Um, not a question. I just wanted to say congratulations, um, Daniel, on your James Beard Award. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty thrilling. We, we, we found out here, I was here with Mick and Leaf and my granddaughter when we found out, and I said that I got, I got to win the award without having to go to the obnoxious event. 
So <laughs> I was really, I was, I, I just got to, we get, we got to have a private, a private party here, but it was, it was very exciting and it's a real honor and uh, it probably means I get to do more books. Fantastic. <laughs> That's great. Well, it was our, um, very good luck and good fortune to have you here this week right after that happened so yeah yeah i found out wednesday yeah it's amazing we were watching the internet Thank just you. to see what was see when the results were going to be released gretchen you we should just mention that if people um have not bought the book that we yes, do we have um copies at the library um and you can call us um on monday or email us if you did not uh, purchase a copy with your ticket if you'd like to get a copy and we'll have book plates, which we're going to send off to Dan for him to sign um, soon. Okay, perfect. Um, and you can get Good. Bread Alone Bread at the Sharon Farm Market or at Paley's. Um, or better yet, you can bake your own loaf, right? Um, exactly. Even better. So thank you so much, Dan. We're so glad you could share your passion and knowledge with us tonight. And I also want to just shout out to Bread Alone, um, which will be donating a loaf of bread for every book that we sell to our local food pantry in Lakeville, corner food pantry. Another reason to buy a book. So thank you very much for that. Um, and we have some great events coming up um, in the next few weeks that will also take the place of our traditional book signing. Holly's gonna put up a list here if you wanna take a look at those um, before you leave. So thank you everyone and be safe and well and happy baking and happy reading. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Ridiculous.